I, I want to, um, I just wanted to say hi before we screen share. Um, so I, can I just ask, when I, we screen share, I won't be visible, is that right? Um, at the moment, Carmen, there's the, um, the first slide, which is interdependence is central uh -huh. to the radical restructuring of power on the left, large. Okay. And then there's okay. a very small window that you are within. <laughs> Okay, I might step out of frame when I'm presenting, though, just so I can be on my feet and gesticulate. Okay. Um, but, um, but yes, I'll be working from the presentation. So, um, yeah, I also just want to thank everybody here who's here virtually. I know there's some amazing artists and cultural workers here, and I know um, there's various um, forms of labor that went into everybody making time and space to be here today. So I thank you. I also learned a little bit about you from Fayen. And um, I, you know, just appreciate the um, intention um, that you devote to your work. So um, thanks. And um, I am going to start with this first image and I'm going to have it up while I'm doing my introduction. And uh, it's a slogan that I've been using lately, which is um, was uh, drawn in red pencil by an animator that I work with um, named uh, Heather Kai Smith. And um, it says interdependence is central to the radical restructuring of power. Um, I'm going to be modeling a few ex accessibility practices today, so I'm going to be describing my images as well as I'm, I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement and an access check as well. So um, as part of um, this cross-border uh, project that I'm involved in uh, by Mia Amir and DeLeslin George Warren uh, called Unsettling Dramaturgy. I've been uh, meeting with a group of uh, disabled and indigenous artists over the last two years on Zoom and uh, we dedicate most of our time to the process of accessibility and land acknowledgement. So I'd like to uh, introduce myself in the same way that I would in that collective. Um, and you just imagine that I'm unmuting myself because we usually start muted. So um, it's Carmen here, Carmen speaking. I'm talking to you from the unceded and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people. Um, I, today I want to acknowledge the histories of racism and colonialism on this land. These histories are very much alive and still causing harm. Um, uh, my grandparents emigrated here from Italy and Greece. I was born here and I grew up here, um, but we were very much uh, uh, uninvited guests on this land. Um, there was never a treaty and this land was never surrendered. So it is a privilege to be able to speak to you from here today about accessibility. <sighs> I'm talking from my bedroom. Um, we just moved into a new place, uh, which is about a block away from Pandora Park. Um, it's actually the park where my parents met over 40 years ago. Um, when they met, my dad gave my mom his uh, number on a $5 bill uh, so they could stay in touch. Uh, this is what he had at the time. Um, this was only weeks after um, his brother tragically died in a car accident. Um, Pandora Park was when, where teenagers uh, would gather at the, at the time, teenagers from surrounding high schools in East Vancouver. Um, it was either there or at a, a nearby billiards hall where they could buy beer um, or it, the fried chicken shop across the street. Um, the neighborhood is called Hastings Sunrise. Um, and I've been enjoying taking our almost two-year-old daughter, Pearl, um, on walks in the neighborhood. I put her in the carrier and uh, um, we walk. And um, we also <laughs> listen to seagulls on our patio. There's a seagull nest on the building across the street from our place. And uh, sometimes we can hear baby seagulls, which sound like someone lightly blowing a whistle. Um, I also feel the need Oh, actually, I'm going to also give a physical description. Um, I have olive skin, um, black hair. Uh, I have a beard. I'm wearing a Oxford shirt today with that's cream colored with um, beige stripes, um, black jeans, and a summery flat cap that's brown with these over-ear headphones on top of that. Um, 
I, I feel the need to say that this talk was supposed to happen on August 4th. Um, at the time I was in hospital, uh, I won't say the medical name for the condition that brought me there, but um, the episodes that bring me to hospital about twice a year are called crises, and um, they're very much a crisis when they happen. Um, they can easily land me in uh, intensive care and cause damage to my bones and organs. Um, they cause debilitating pain uh, that makes it difficult for me to advocate for myself. And um, it also restricts my breathing. So I take um, short, shallow breaths. Um, this time, as the result of COVID restrictions, I had to be dropped off at emergency and just trust that the healthcare workers that I met would um, know how to care for me. Um, it was my first time uh, in hospital for over two years. Um, and not to say that I haven't needed emergency medical services, I've just stayed away um, out of fear. So I'm kind of in this place of trying to find trust again. Um, thank you for rescheduling for today and uh, for letting me share that as well. Um, in terms of an access check, I'm carrying a bit of pain today, so I think I'll be okay. I, I just might uh, get up and walk around if I feel uncomfortable. Um, and uh, other than that, um, if a message comes in through chat, I usually hear it in a robotic voice in my ear, so I might pause if that happens. Um, other than that, um, my access needs are taken care of. Um, check. Um, at this point, another collective member would describe themselves, uh, um, acknowledge the land that they're speaking from, um, they would uh, share any access related needs or, or requests. Um, they, would, they would talk about their, um, their practice and uh, you, we kind of make room in these gatherings with this collective for people to check in about how they're feeling, if they have a question that they've been thinking about in relation to their work. Um, and this is the most consistent part of our gatherings uh, where we spend uh, time um, on, on the process of um, accessibility and land acknowledgement and uh, developing protocols that work for us and our group um, in this virtual space. Um, so I'm going to conclude this part of my intro by sharing a statement that one of our collective members, Jill Carter, wrote. Um, Jill teaches at the Indigenous Studies Department and at the um, Drama, um, Theatre and Performance Studies departments at um, University of Toronto. And uh, while she had ex uh, presented about what's expressed in this statement pr prior to reading it, uh, writing it, um, she was really ex inspired by a recent Praxis session that we had and now uses this statement as her outgoing email signature. So um, a volunteer uh, will be reading the words of uh, Jill Carter. Amelia? Zoom had erected its headquarters in San Jose, California, while Skype has erected one key arm of its operations in Palo Alto, California. This is the traditional ter territory of the Mawikum Ohon tribal nation. Current members of this nation are direct descendants of the many missionized tribal groups from across the region. We who are able to connect with each other via Zoom or Skype are deeply indebted to the more weak um, or home people as the lands and waters they continue to steward now support the people, pipelines and technologies that carry our breaths, images and words across vast distances to others. This is Faye Ann and I'll continue reading. As I engage in written communication such as this email, I personally acknowledge the debt that I have incurred and that is amassing each time I open my notebook. We are all indebted to those peoples and communities whose waters and lands have been poisoned as a result of the extraction of metals and rare earth elements required to fabricate the machinery through which we speak, hear and view each other. We are indebted to those peoples whose working lives, youth and vitality have been spent in unsafe spaces and intolerable intoler conditions so that many citizens of the so-called developed world might have easy access to these and related devices. As we encounter each other each day through our email accounts, our messaging apps, our virtual meeting rooms and chat rooms, let us strive to remain mindful of the incalculable debt that we owe. 
Thank you. Um, and on the topic of accessibility in this virtual space, I want to just say that this is a relaxed space, so you can feel free to move around or leave if you need to. I think of accessibility as an ongoing negotiation that's guided by the needs in a community at any given time. So in some ways, we're all helping to maintain the accessibility of this space. Um, I also have a few people here who are helping me coordinate. Um, Fan has done a lot of coordinating already to bring everyone here, Amelia as well. Um, and, uh, you know, folks are helping me coordinate um, the virtual space, uh, as well as there's a couple access workers who are providing um, sign as well. And um, some of these negotiations around access, um, they aren't often considered um, as the work itself, but today I want to acknowledge that's through these uh, negotiations negotiations that my work happened. So I want to thank you all um, for supporting me today. Um, I'm going to uh, show my next image now. And this is from a project um, that I did in 2007, even before I started thinking of myself as an artist. Um, depicted is my friend Elliot, and he is in a supermarket. Um, he is selecting a beverage uh, out of a refrigerator and he has this large sign attached to him um, in there's a, re, uh, a large uh, corrugated plastic sign with the word disabled on it and it's written in um, big blocky black letters um, re reading uh, from top to bottom vertically. Um, and uh, so at the time, I didn't know any other people who were disabled. Um, I wasn't connected to a community yet. Um, and I was just thinking about how adopting the label changed my position within my community. And so at one point, I just asked my friend Elliot, who I went to college with, um, he's not disabled, but I asked him if I could disable him. Um, and for some reason, he, he agreed. Um, and so I, I, I attached this large corrugated sign to him with zap straps in ways that would restrict um, his movement as well as impair his vision and hearing in some ways. Um, and he just did his daily routine. Um, he went to the supermarket. He tried to board the bus. Um, he uh, he went had lunch at a cafe. And... Um, and we just kind of use this experience to like, like think about how, um, you know, uh, acquiring disability um, changes one's access to public space and how it reveals, um, you know, social and cultural biases regarding disability. Um, people were asking Elliot uh, what his disability was to tell, you know, them the story about his disability. Um, they were asking him if he was making fun of people who were disabled. Um, he actually wasn't able to board the bus because he was told he was too much of an obstacle for other people. Um, and uh, he also had to negotiate just like the, the physical environment. So like duck under uh, doorways uh, to make room for the sign, <laughs> as well as just fold himself into a, a booth uh, when he was, he was uh, having lunch at the cafe. Um, and this was really just my first effort to start a dialogue about what it meant to be disabled. Um, my next image, please. This is an image from 2010. Uh, it's when I was studying at the uh, at Portland State University. Um, I was in the art and social practice MFA program. I, where I got my master's. Um, and the image is uh, of me riding tandem um, on a bike with another artist in my cohort named Adam Moser. Um, <laughs> two white guys on a bike, me on the back, him on the front. Um, and so I, I'd like to share a reflection from my time in grad school now that I wrote um, just about, it's a piece about uh, learning and accessibility. Um, Brian, read the excerpt if someone wanted. Hello, I'm Brian. Um, my skin is also olive skin. Uh, I'm wearing a red cap that says Mogere, which literally means cap in um, Aranda language from Central Australia. Um, it's also a red cap with white letters, so therefore you can imagine some of the interesting conversations I've had with people lately. 
uh, making reference to, of course, uh, MAGA <laughs> caps. And... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I get some interesting conversations, which actually opens up a lot of other interesting things around language and, and right. the people who've been here before. Um, now I will um, proceed to this reading. Um, so, <clears throat> if someone wanted to lead a foraging expedition, the rest of the group participated and responded thoughtfully. Their presence didn't feel like an accommodation. It felt like a community coming together to consider someone's proposal. Although I didn't understand it in these terms at the time, it was an example of accessibility in practice. It made a difference to me that my requests were connected to my learning experience and not my membership in a group of people with the same diagnosis. My classmates were happy to do things differently because we were part of a learning community that understood that everyone learns differently. In this community, there was a general understanding that images being shown had to be described. When I wanted to discuss an article that wasn't available in a format that my computer could read, I knew that I could send it to the group and ask that we read it in class. Later, we tried bowling with our eyes closed. We even got our hands on a tandem bike so I could join the group when there were plans to ride together to a project site. Tamsin, I continue reading excerpts starting Somehow Disclosing. Somehow disclosing my needs in this context didn't feel shameful. Everybody knew that they could make a request if something wasn't working for them and they didn't have to be registered with the Disability Resource Centre for someone to take them seriously. They didn't have to choose from a handful of predetermined options. They identified their needs under the premise that they would get the space and consideration that they deserved after offering the same courtesy to others. For the first time, the learning community that I belong to challenged me to envision what accessibility meant beyond a policy that was enforced from the top down. It wasn't long before I was viewing the kind of accessibility that I was familiar with as a band-aid on a failing system. A protocol for the times when someone encountered a barrier that confirmed their suspicion that what they were trying to access wasn't, wasn't made with them in mind. The more time I spent with my classmates, the more I was convinced that accessibility at its root was an agreement with one's community an agreement to support others in the ways they wanted to be supported. Thank you. Um, my next image, please. This image um, is, it depicts a group of about 15 people send, standing in a single file line behind me. Um, they are shutting their eyes, they are linking arms, um, they <laughs> are, look enthusiastic about what they are doing. Um, I am leading at the front, I'm wearing a black leather jacket and a black wool flat cap. Look a little younger than I do today. Um, I don't have a beard in this photo. Um, I'm leading them through the park blocks in, on the Portland State University campus. And this walk ended at the um, front steps of the Portland Art Museum. And so this is a, a project that I, I, I developed while in grad school. One day I just asked my classmates to meet me in front of the art building and uh, to line up behind me and link arms and shut their eyes. And I took them on an hour long walk without really telling them what we were doing. Um, and um, I kind of developed the walk in grad school with them and then started leading public walks. This is one of my first public walks that's depicted. Um, the point of the walk is to uh, d dedicate time and space to exercising the non-visual senses. So I think of this project as exercise for the non-visual senses. It's specifically not a, a walk in my shoes. Um, there, are, there are aspects of my experience that I can't translate for an audience, like say the sense of alienation that I feel as someone who doesn't use vision, um, who, who lives in a very visual culture. So um, I really um, think of this walk as uh, an opportunity to use one's non-visual senses to navigate their surroundings. Um, it's also about the um, system of support that coalesces when a group of people come together. Um, next image, please. This should be a poster. Um, it advertises an event called What Can a Body Do? D um, Investigating Disability in Contemporary Art. It was curated by Amanda Caccia. Um, 
a, I, <laughs> I'm my name is featured on this poster along with the names Sonora Taylor, um, Georgina Cleage, uh, Catherine Sherwood, Ann Millett Gallant, Rosemary Garland Thompson, and Tobin Siebers. Um, the poster also depicts a figure and the slogan, Piss on Pity, which comes from disability activism in the UK. Um, so Amanda Katia is a curator who's disabled. She uh, came to Portland to participate in one of my walks and then in, uh, was the first person to show my work. Uh, she showed the walking tour in 2011. Um, and she, we met at a crucial time for me. Um, I was really uh, looking for uh, mentors and, and peers within the disability community um, and the disability arts movement. Um, uh, and and through uh, <laughs> through working with Amanda, I've met some of my closest friends and mentors. Um, and also, I think Amanda connected me to this critical critical discourse um, and sort of a history that I could understand my practice in relation to. Um, so this event um, was a, a roundtable at um, that she invited me to, and she sat me between Georgina and Sonora um, and. You know, at the time, I I'd only read about these people and read their work, um, and um, you know, I really didn't know how I fit into this group at the time. Um, I felt like it was a privilege to be there, um, but these are real, like I, I would say, like pillars of the critical disability world and disability arts movement. Um, and uh, after the event, I I made a connection with Georgina. Um, who asked me to if I uh, to to write a piece for um, an upcoming issue of uh, or a disability studies quarterly that she was editing um, that focused on museum experience and blindness. Um, so I wrote a piece uh, for that called a, a new model for uh, access in the museum, and um, we started a correspondence. Me and Georgina, our conversations were we we laughed a lot. Georgina is very funny. Um, I got the sense that we both enjoyed making trouble for museums. Um, and uh, it was through Georgina that I, I, you know, she connected me to, to this critical discourse that really validated my own position on the topic of accessibility. Um, she had been asking questions like, why are descriptive tours only offered once a month at the museum? What about the other days? What about, you know, what if I'm not available on the day that it's offered? Um, and she'd been asking these questions and making space for these conversations for years. So I really thought of um, her work as having laid the ground for my work. Um, and, and I was really able to see um, my practice in sort of a lineage of um, disabled artists, uh, scholars, and activists through working with Georgina. Um, so uh, shortly after that piece was published, um, I heard from Georgia Krantz, at, uh, who invited me, who was also published in that issue, um, and she invited me to um, uh, make a project or, or work on a project through uh, the Minds Eye program at the Guggenheim. And um, Minds Eye is a unique program that uh, it seeks uh, direct consultation with members of the blind and low vision community. So participants will kind of like propose, uh, you know, ideas for the kinds of programs they want to participate in, but also like the kinds of experiences they want to have in the museum. And then Georgia would um, advocate for those things within the institution and make them happen. Um, the project that I conducted uh, with the group was called The Touchy Subject, and it was about tactility in the museum. Um, and um, you can go to the next image. Uh, is, is it two people in the rotunda of the Guggenheim? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So um, what we did was I, I negotiated for uh, tactile access to a few objects from the collection. And then we spent time with them in a, a workshop environment with um, education staff members, uh, our hands on those objects. And, and we tried to develop vocabulary for how they felt. And uh, this experience kind of informed a series of public tours where a visitor could link arms with a education staff member shut their eyes and then their hand would be directed to tactile points of interest, which uh, included the objects from the collection, 
as well as the building itself, which, you know, the Guggenheim is a large sculpture. Um, in the image, um, there are two people who are kneeling at the uh, rotunda of the Guggenheim. And um, they, uh, one of their hands is being directed to this point on the ground that indicates the center of the rotunda. And it's marked with two um, dots. And if you stand there and project your voice, um, it creates this in interesting acoustic um, uh, quality where it seems as if your your voice is like surrounding you and just kind of relates to like the rounded edges edges of the rotunda and, and the height of the ceiling. Um, after doing this uh, work uh, with Georgia and uh, and Mind's Eye, um, I started to think about the ways that the accommodations that I'm often offered as someone who doesn't use vision, uh, especially in the museum context. So I started to think about the ways that I'm invited to participate and how that really defines my participation and the way that I'm understood by others. So I started thinking of those accommodations, those typical offerings as very like restrictive and really not examples of meaningful participation. So I started to think about accessibility as a creative process at that point. And um, when I was back in Portland, I started this conversation with my best friend, Rizal Medina. Um, and we just kind of were thinking about one day um, the various things I could replace my cane with. And we landed on this idea of replacing my cane with a marching band. Um, so you could, <laughs> next image, please. Um, which inform led to this performance where I replaced my cane with a marching band that serves as my navigation system. Um, the image on screen is of a 2019 performance of mobility device that uh, took place on the High Line in New York City. Um, I'm on uh, performing with the, the Hungry March Band. We are all in red and black. Um, and um, the Hungry March Band actually uh, started playing over 12 years ago on um, the occasion of the Mermaid Parade at Coney Island. Um, and uh, for this performance, I took a few trips to New York. We'd meet in a rehearsal space in Williamsburg. And uh, we kind of would just try to think about the kinds of obstacles I might encounter on a walk or the various scenarios I might find myself in uh, while walking. And we tried to develop strategies uh, for how to address those or respond to those situations. And once we had this uh, set of strategies, um, we took the operation outside and we just started practicing until we could move as a single organism. Um, and the, the way that collaboration works uh, it, with mobility, mobility device, I think of it as sort of like an octopus where the um, decision making is shared between the brain and appendages. Um, and I think mobility device for me in, uh, in my practice um, really is sort of a milestone uh, for me in the, the ways that I've, I've, I've found to model open access. So um, the the next image, um, please. Uh, yeah, so this, this uh, I'll get to describing it in, in a little while, but I, the, I, I'd like to spend a little time introducing you uh, to a space in Vancouver called the Purple Thistle Center. Um, so this is a youth-led space for arts and activism that was run by a youth collective um, uh, from 2001 until its eventual closure in uh, 2015. And um, the idea for the space uh, grew out of um, a time when uh, seven teenagers would occasionally meet at their friend Matt Hearn's place. And uh, they would just talk about the kinds of things that they were doing when they were the happiest. And this included like making art, uh, playing music, uh, you, you know, performing, um, making websites, doing animation, gardening, all these kinds of things. And uh, they kind of uh, tried to envision um, a place where, like what a place where they could do all of these things might, um, what that place might look and feel like. And, and these were the seeds that uh, gave rise to what um, they eventually called the thistle, uh, which was a space for youth liberation. Um, and as an adult at the Thistle, you really knew that you were taking up space that was meant for a youth participant. And um, you, you really, as an adult, had to be invited into the space uh, by the collective. Um, 
me and my wife, Kristen, had the privilege of working uh, with, the, with um, participants at the Thistle for a couple years before it closed. Um, and uh, the, you know, they, they did take some protocols uh, or establish some protocols to set a baseline of care within the space. And um, uh, one of their policies was a no assholes policy that just kind of, uh, you know, kind of expressed that forms of aggression, such as, you know, uh, sexism, racism, uh, queer and transphobia and ableism would all be challenged. So just kind of knew what you were in for and uh, when you're in entering the space. Um, and they had this great FAQ sec section on their website, which is still up. So I encourage you to check it out. And I'm just going to have a volunteer read um, a, a little section from the FAQ, which an answers the question, is it like a school? Are there teachers and students? Andy, Max, just, is it like a school? I'll just read on behalf of Andy, um, me, Amelia, he's has, having some internet difficulties. Is it like a school? Are there teachers and students? We are often mistaken from an alternative school. We are not a school, not even a nice democratic one. Think of the, of the thistle more as a resource centre, or better, an alternative to school. People learn all the time at the thistle, and there is a lot of sharing of knowledge and skills going on. We celebrate and strive for horizontal and friendly relationships between mentors and participants. Yeah, so, you know, learning at the Thistle was really learning through exper experimentation, um, failing and maintaining relationships with people who experienced the world differently. Um, you know, the physical space was ever changing just based on the interest of the collective. Um, I, so eventually I was invited by the collective to lead a eight week workshop on the topic of accessibility called um, what was it called? Bodies of Knowledge. <laughs> and, um, and it was an open uh, workshop environment. Uh, we also had like this ongoing uh, discussions every week as well. It was three hour meetings. Um, and we just found different ways to connect to the topic of accessibility, um, you know, based on what we were involved in and, and so explored the topic in relation to um, identity, um, experience and, and class and, um, and also in relation to the Kinder Morgan protests on Burnaby Mountain, which were opposing the, the Trans Mountain expansion uh, here, which, which was a proposal to bring crude oil from the tar sands in Alberta to uh, our ports here. So some of the participants at the Thistle were involved in this movement, and uh, we talked about accessibility in relation to it as well. Um, I would bring examples of accessibility as I understood it, mostly examples of uh, work by my peers in the disability arts movement, um, artists like uh, Christine Sun Kim and Laura Swanson, um, artists who use their embodiment and experience as a po point of departure in a creative process, both like to affirm aspects of their experience, but also to point out social and cultural um, biases regarding, um, you know, different ways of being in the world. Um, Around this time, um, the thistle, well, I, I'll just say first that, and I'll describe this image. So uh, we also did some work outside and kind of uh, outside of, of the, the thistle space and um, just kind of to play or um, with these ideas and experiment. Um, and the image um, on screen is a uh, image of our friend Ellie D, who was the uh, silk screening mentor at the thistle. Um, Ellie is in a black hooded sweatshirt sitting on a gallery floor and Ellie's describing um, the gallery space to a young participant who is um, I think like crouching um, and holding their white cane uh, which is folded so um, uh, this was part of a series of non-visual tours at the Vancouver Art Gallery where uh, Thistle participants uh, would offer um, non-visual tours to, to visitors. Um, um, the, yeah, around this time, uh, the Thistle hosted a three-day uh, 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 symposium called uh, the Social Spaces Summit. And um, I remember being in conversation with a group of people and hearing this term radical accessibility. And it was just being used uh, casually to describe accessibility that wasn't imposed from the top down, something that was 
uh, more open and responsive. And um, I really connected with this idea of radical accessibility. And I started to think about how accessibility operated at, um, at the Thistle and, um, and really started defining accessibility at that, um, at that time as a measure of agency. So I was thinking about accessibility as agency. And, and I think that really described um, the Thistle as a place that was dedicated to youth liberation where youth uh, participants uh, were the decision makers um, and, and programmed the space and, and everything. So um, uh, that was, I think, a point in, um, in thinking through ac accessibility. Um, Shortly after this uh, Bodies of Knowledge workshop, I uh, curated a panel at the Queens Museum in New York City, um, and uh, also called Bodies of Knowledge. And um, I invited Amanda Caccia and Sonora Taylor, um, Jason Da Silva, uh, Sandy Yi, and Laura Swanson to talk about their work, um, and then you know how it in intersected with ideas of accessibility. Um, and during the Q and A um, after that talk. Um, Stephanie Nadeau, who was uh, then the Curator of Public Engagement at the Ottawa Art Gallery, asked the question, um, uh, how might one implement radical accessibility in a museum? And um, this was, this intrigued me, so I, I st it started uh, I, me on this line of thinking. And I started to envision the next image, if you could get that on screen. And the next, uh, so this this is the um, uh, accessible icon project by Sarah Hendren and collaborators, and it's a it's an updated version or re 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 envisioning or um, uh, of the you know the um, international icon for access, which we sometimes call like the wheelchair symbol. Um, and when I was in New York for this panel um, at the Queens Museum, I had visited MoMA with. Um, with Amanda Caccia, and and at, and, and during that visit, um, the accessible icon project was was uh, displayed on a wall at MoMA. I think they just had purchased uh, the work for the collection, and looking at the work on a gallery wall, I just thought I, I it was so strange to see, and I thought about how strange it is to mark accessible space with a sign, um, and I started I kind of concluded at that point that like the museum it could not be radically assess accessible or even accessible on an ongoing basis, um, unless um, there was an agreement as to what that meant, like were people who were requiring that access or that care um, def able to define the terms of it and so at that point I was really thinking of accessibility as as temporary um, as, and and I started describing it as an ongoing effort to hold space for a diversity of complex needs in the midst of sy systemic barriers um, and you know, I th I thought that accessibility really required people in in caring relationships with each other, um, you know, in order to hold space around us certain terms. Um, and uh, yeah, I I just I guess this is kind of the line of thinking that led to um, me writing a statement uh, called "Open Access." Um, which is five uh, principles um, that I wrote um, that really, I think, describe my position on the topic of accessibility. So I'll have a volunteer read those uh, principles now. Um, Amelia and I are going to share the reading. Amelia? Open access relies on those present, what their needs are and how they can find support with each other and in their communities. It is a perpetual negotiation of trust between those who practice support as a mutual exchange. Open access is radically different than a policy that temporarily removes a barrier to participation for a group with definitive needs. It acknowledges that everyone carries a body of local knowledge and is an expert in their own right. Open access is the root system of embodied learning. It cultivates trust amongst those involves involved and enables each member to self-identify and occupy a point of orientation that centers complex embodiment. Open access disrupts the disabling conditions that limit one's agency and potential to thrive. It reimagines normalcy as a continuum of embodiments, identities, realities and learning styles and operates under the premise that interdependence is central to the radical restructuring of power. 
Open access is a temporary, collectively held space where participants can find comfort in disclosing their needs and preferences with one another. It is a responsive support network that adapts as needs and available resources change. Thank you. Um, and so after I wrote uh, Open Access, I, I started sharing it with people, sharing it with friends. I would I print copies for people in the audience when I was giving talks. Um, and, and I shared it with a friend, uh, Megan Arnie Johnston, who was the director of the Model Contemporary Art Center in uh, Sligo, Ireland. And um, Megan really resonated with some of the ideas um, in, in the statement and established this residency program um, called the Bureau of Radical Accessibility. And um, me and Kristen were uh, some of the first artists inv um, invited uh, uh, through that program. And um, I'm going to uh, show a couple projects that I made while I was there. So my next image, please. And that's an image of me reaching up uh, and tying a red cord to the wood paneling in, in a gallery. Um, I am wearing a uh, brown uh, wool cap and a matching wool vest. And I, it's a sort of Ju Joseph Boy sort of uh, wardrobe choice. Um, and I'm tying a red cord to um, fix fixtures that already kind of existed in the spaces. So like uh, table legs, uh, uh, um, handrails, uh, things like this. And um, these red cords were indicating my most used kind of route, um, uh, most commonly used routes while I was there. Um, and, and I would use these cords just to like, as a tactile wayfinding device. Um, it was a temporary system of access that I could install and then could easily, uh, easily E easily uh, deinstall, um, and I just use it to feel my way through the galleries. And they kind of just allowed me to go from places like the elevator to the uh, cafe, and from the cafe to the second floor gallery that I was I was working um, in. Um, and otherwise, the space like it was really hard for me to navigate uh, the space. Um, so this really improved my experience there. Um, and it also disrupted commonly used routes for other people. Um, so they had to negotiate um, the, this red cord as well. Um, the next image, please. This was also from my uh, time at the Model Cent uh, Contemporary Art Center. Um, it, it's an image of people uh, laying on their stomachs, looking at um, uh, paintings that are uh, hung very low uh, on the wall, uh, only inches from the, the ground. So this was like a, a dramatic rehang of a permanent collection show. Um, and it's called For Eric Ferguson. And Eric is a, um, a dancer who is disabled. Um, uh, and, and Eric was the first person to introduce me to the disability arts movement when I moved to Portland. And we would meet and have these great conversations about art and disability and talk about disruptive museums interventions. Um, and this um, uh, uh, project, um, it kind of troubles access for the standing viewer, so they have to kind of like <laughs> problem solve a way to comfortably view the work. Um, they have to like, you know, crouch or get low to the ground. So the viewing experience becomes an embodied experience. And um, while it troubles access for the standing viewer, it also just um, um, uh, opens access up for um, children and folks in wheelchairs as well. Um, my next image, please. Oh, actually, um, yeah, yeah, you could just keep that on. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, so when I got back to uh, Vancouver from, from Ireland, um, I, I wanted to introduce uh, the open access uh, statement to to friends um, at a, a group of artists at Gallery Gachet. Um, and um, on screen now is an image of Gallery Gachet's storefront um, in its old location on East Cordova in Vancouver. Um, the, there's a handmade wooden ramp up, uh, leading to the front door and uh, the ramp had to be uh, pulled out and uh, when the, the the uh, gallery was opened and then hauled back in when it was closed. Uh, I think this is a nice metaphor for how accessibility worked at the space. Gallery Gachet is a collectively run gallery. Um, it's dedicated to um, um, this mandate of, of demystifying 
um, issues relating to mental health. Um, and just a little context um, uh, about the, um, the neighborhood where the gallery is situated. It's called the Downtown East Side neighborhood. And um, it's a place with many intersecting communities. Um, it's a community that has uh, endured five waves of displacement since colonization. Um, and I think the trauma from this displacement um, has it really can be seen in the ways people band together in times of need, which is every day. Um, and also in the organizations that exist there, which um, provide a combination of um, a medical, uh, social, and, and cultural services. And um, a lot of the organizations in the downtown east side um, fulfill needs that aren't available through the public health system. And they're actually like direct responses to harmful institutional models, medical models, um, you know, uh, psychiatry um, in the downtown in downtown east side there are many people <laughs> who are resisting um uh, i guess systemic violence um in 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 many ways um and so you know the organizations there really respond to needs that are present in the community and and they're you know uh, grassroots organizations uh, that have sprung up um to to respond to those um uh, so the project that we were engaging in at Gallery Gachet with this group of artists that I had convened was um, we, we, were, we, we were meeting around this idea of conducting an unsolicited accessibility audit of the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, and the group that I convened really represented intersections that I feel are underrepresented in conversations about accessibility. Um, some of us uh, identified as disabled. Others did not and identified as um, mad or young or indigenous. Um, other I, uh, participants who did identify as disabled were all, also exploring other aspects of their uh, experience, um, you know, experiences of class, um, their identity of some as someone who is trans or a person of color. And I felt like um, what we were doing and, and exploring really was in line with uh, the, um, the principles of disability justice, which was a framework that was produced by a collective of um, black, brown, and queer activists in California in 2005. And um, disability justice poses that um, forms of oppression such as um, racism, sexism, queer and transphobia, our uh, colonialism, they're all intertwined with and supported by ableism. Um, so one of the first things that I had everybody do was to respond to a question, which was, um, what conditions must be in place in order for you to feel welcome at the Vancouver Art Gallery and thrive as an artist? And um, the, the, I'm going to share um, uh, the the group's responses uh, uh, to, or to those to that question. And um, if the the volunteers' reading could uh, not pause too much between each um, uh, statement, that would be great. And read this more like a list. That that would be awesome. Thank you. There's a number of volunteers, so we could just go one to another, and I'll just read out the name in between, um, beginning with Amelia. I want not to fight for access all the time. I want to blend into a crowd. I want every city to have accessible ramps. I want acknowledgement of the existing power dynamics in the space. I want people to question why that power exists in the first place. I want more curiosity, playfulness and informal spaces. I want venues to be completely wheelchair and scooter accessible at the minimum. I want larger printed text. I want to pay what you can slash buy donation option for admission, which doesn't shame people. I want things to be hung at varying heights. I want a scent reduced space. I want seating that is comfortable and supportive of larger bodies and of people who would like to lay down. I want some quiet options for those who get overwhelmed by a lot of random noise. I want all of the workers in the space to be paid fairly, have opportunities for rest and for their ideas for the space and the people in it to be taken seriously. Katie. Um, unmute your microphone, Katie. I want specific acknowledgement of the Indigenous land that the space is on. I want some unpredictability within safe boundaries. I want opportunities to consent to taking different kinds of risks. I want to not just be able to physically get into the space, 
I want to have a real chance at being a part of things once I'm in. I want artists to establish a baseline for their self-care. I want to be able to sit on the ground when I'm viewing art in a gallery. I want curators to consider physical access when developing the layout of their shows. I want the Vancouver Art Gallery to have an access coordinator. I want to engage in more playful systems of policy making and change. I want museums to stop teaching children about art. I want children to start teaching museums about access. I want multi curatorial essays. I want to resist my own art opening. I want the Vancouver Art Gallery to hire a disabled curator. I want the Vancouver Art Gallery to stop charging over $20 for admission. I want the Vancouver Art Gallery to collect work by living disabled artists. I want the art community in Vancouver to be less academic. I want people to stop exchanging their business cards at openings. I want people who occupy public platforms to redistribute their institutional access. I want more places to sit. Holly? <laughs> I want to touch the art. I want to understand the work on display. I want more work to engage my non-visual sense. I want to understand the work on display without having to read about it first. Without having to read about it first. I want to understand the work on display without having to I want more work to engage my non-visual senses. I want more work to engage my non-visual senses. I want spaces where I can feel safe. I want spaces where I can feel safe. I want spaces where I can bring my whole self. Where all the parts of my identity are honoured and recognised. I want spaces where I can bring my whole self. Where all of the parts of my identity are honoured and recognised. Twelve fifty one pm. Places where I can bring my whole self. Where all of the parts of my identity are honoured and recognised. Thea. I want anti-racist actions and words. I want anti-colonial practices to be talked about and put into practice. I want spaces where I don't feel like I'm under surveillance. I want a welcoming atmosphere, not a space where I feel like I don't fit or belong. I want free food and drinks. I want decision makers to be poor, sick and disabled, queer and trans people of colour. I want the curators of museums and shows to be open-minded to different aesthetics, not closed-minded and conservative. I want museums to stop shutting doors on people. Pip. I want to be my true self, out loud and overtly. I want to be unapolog unapologetically wild. I want a home where I feel comfortable and safe. I want freedom to move. I want people to understand that cultural theft is not essential to the creation of art. I want to let go of the need to compete with others. I want children to be honoured and respected, protected and cherished, listened to and centred. I want intergenerational movement building. I want to foster non-hierarchical ways of being in the world and relating to each other. I want to stop making assumptions about what people need. Amelia? I want to make my ancestors proud. I want people to know I'm sick. I want to problematize. I want to stay in bed. I want to stretch. I want things to be simple. I want body shaming to cease to exist. I want people to trust each other. I want a world free of cops. Tamsin? I want tenderness. I want for sick people to not be seen as blueprints for how not to be in the world. I want to unlearn shame. I want racialized people to have time and space to fucking breathe and be in peace. I want people to recognize my education. I want medicine. I want to play. Lizzie? I want to be more than a body. I want to process in my own way, on my own terms, in my own time. I want to infiltrate. I want people to understand I don't owe them anything. I want time and space to rest. I want to thrive and not be in survival mode all the time. Thank you. Um, and so this list um, of I want statements was really our framework for assessing the Vancouver Art Gallery. And um, we eventually made an exhibition about our process and uh, we also hosted a three-day symposium about ideas of accessibility and creative practice. Um, and I'm going to show one of the works that we made together. Um, and it's on screen, uh, the next image, it's a 
it's um, a didactic wall label um, and it's being edited, been edited in red corrective marker. So just imagine sort of like a first year English paper that you got back from your prof and there's a lot of corrections to be made. Um, and so um, we ended up finding this wall label uh, when we were visiting the art gallery one day and it describes a show of photos by a Canadian photographer, Christos de Kikos. And um, all the images in the show depicted um, interior shots of um, galleries and studios, all ha uh, with um, objects that were made by Indigenous artists in them. But there was no context as to um, who made the objects, who they belonged to, or what they were. Um, and just reading this text aloud, it became really obvious that to us that it misrepresented colonization. It, it referred to first contact as an exchange between cultures. Um, and this text was written by, and the, sh the show was curated by, um, the chief curator and associate director of the institution. So we started to think about what this text could be or would have been if it was edited by artists at Gallery Gachet, which is exactly what we did. We opened it up for artists to edit in red corrective marker. Some artists um, replaced colonial place names with their traditional names. Others um, had called out first contact as genocide. Um, we thought of this work as providing the decolonial narrative that wasn't available through the museum. And um, we thought of it as like a reflection of the shared politics at Gallery Gachet at the time. Um, so shortly after this, um, I, I started um, an open access campaign and campaigning with uh, these ideas. Um, and uh, I, I, I started leading workshops and uh, really where I was introducing open access to staff and community members at museums and universities. And I'd work with the entire staff um, of an institution, depending on the, the size of the institution, I guess. But there was representatives from, you know, upper management. There was like, you know, the director, uh, uh, curatorial staff, education staff. Um, conservation, interpretation, front of house, and docents as well. And um, they would all think about accessibility from their own position within the institution. Um, and so, and open access framed these gatherings as well. And this uh, open access campaign started after um, a show about my progress with open access at Ottawa City Hall. Um, uh, that was curated by Stephanie Nadeau. And um, the image, the next image, which is a group shot of um, a group of people holding a banner uh, with one of the open access tenants on it, um, was from a corresponding workshop um, at the Ottawa Art Gallery. And so this is uh, some of the participants of that workshop. And I really think of this, as these, these gatherings as like setting a new context for um, uh, conversation and commitments around accessibility. Um, and uh, and depicted too is my friend David Garneau, who is a, uh, a Métis painter and curator, who I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, these gatherings kind of have led to longer term engagements with institutions. Um, and I'm going to show uh, one of those, which was um, my show Guidelines and uh, an international curatorial residency that I I co-curated with David called um, um, Living Agreement. So the next image, um, in 2019, I had the show Guidelines at the BAMP Center for Arts and Creativity, and I got the opportunity to make two new commissions. Um, one of them was this, this sculpture, uh, sorry, <laughs> installation depicted um, in an image. Um, um, it includes 13 freestanding columns um, that are mirrored and they're rectangular and they're situated at 30, 60, and 90 degree angles to create a confusing visual um, experience. And there's um, uh, a route that's implied through the installation in red cord. Um, the next piece, so that was the installation component of the show. Um, next image. Um, the next piece was an animation that I, I, I produced with uh, animator Heather Kai Smith. And on screen is a still from that animation in red pencil. Um, it depicts a, a, a disability rights protest. 
Um, and Heather's uh, practice involves uh, working with documentation of protests and then rotoscoping over that material. So the source material for the image on screen uh, was documentation of the 504 sit-in in, in uh, 1977, uh, where a group of disabled um, people um, occupied a federal building in, um, in San Francisco uh, for amendments to the Rehabilitation Act, which uh, preceded the um, Americans with Disabilities. Disabilities Act. Um, uh, as part of the, the cur international curatorial residency that me and David uh, uh, organized, um, it was really making space for, for uh, us to consider open access. Um, and I kind of invited David in to program um, some sort of um, uh, sessions around indigenous ideas of, of accessibility um, and representation and um, protocols for gathering as well. Um, and um, I'm gonna just show you one of my kind of like multiple year engagements with an institution. So this is with the McKenzie Art Gallery in Re Regina, Saskatchewan. Um, um, the image, the next image um, is from a program that uh, I, I led uh, in November of last year. And um, uh, yeah, this, this program grew out of a question which was, can we touch anything in the collection? Um, and uh, uh, so just to backfill some history. So um, David Garneau, he came to Vancouver to uh, see the exhibition about the audit of the Vancouver Art Gallery. Then he invited me to, um, to speak at the University of Regina and introduced me to staff at the McKenzie Art Gallery while I was there. And um, I met Nicole Nugent, um, who uh, really uh, advocated for my work within the institution. And, um, and it's led to a dialogue that we've been uh, holding there for, for the last three years. Um, I, I mentioned the, these connections because I really think that sometimes accessibility hinges on one person. So I really, I really believe in this idea uh, of accessibility being relational. Um, and uh, uh, so with, with this program, uh, with the image that, that, that's showing right now, um, uh, we, so Nicole, um, she kind of asked the conservator uh, what objects they could select uh, for us to touch with bare hands. Um, and, um, and they found four sculpture, works of sculpture. So the image shows uh, a couple of participants with their hands on those sculptures. Um, and during this program, we used a framework that Georgina and Fayan produced um, as part of their work with the Cadis Institute, um, describing the critical modes of touch. So this is a, um, an, how one might approach touching a collected art object in order to discover details about it that wouldn't be available through visual inspection. Um, and so the critical modes of touch describe an approach to um, uh, grasping, um, tracing with fingertips, um, manipulation, and then moving through. Um, uh, the next, the next image is a 3D rendering of an installation. So um, I'm going to have a major exhibition at the McKenzie Art Gallery next year. Um, and it's also going to be an occasion to share the collective statement for accessibility that I'm working on with staff. So with these longer term engagements, I really like to wor um, work toward a collective statement for accessibility that, um, that really kind of represents the institution's position on the topic and their commitment. And, and this being a document that um, has, you know, involves community input and that could be reevaluated and evolve over time with continued input by community. So my show next year will be, um, uh, we'll be sharing the McKenzie's new statement for, uh, collective statement for accessibility. And this is in line with a strategic plan for accessibility at McKenzie as well. And um, this 3D rendering, so it's, it's a pretty monumental <laughs> installation uh, that it shows. And um, it, the design was uh, produced by Michael Liss of Good Weather and Associates. I work with Michael on my installation work and Michael has provided the description uh, for this work. So um, these are the words of Michael Liss. Benjamin. This image shows a perspective view as a visitor approaches the second entrance to the installation. 
From this second entrance, the visitor is invited to proceed beneath the ramp at the point that the ramp is high enough for a person standing to walk safely underneath. The visitor is guided by a red string to the inner circle in a quarter turn of the diameter of the ramp to emerge near the centre of the room, inside the ring of mirrors and near the innermost circle of benches beneath the acoustical hemisphere. It's kind of an abstract view. So basically the installation is a, a large um, accessible uh, ramp that is spiraling and it's, it's a spiral, spiraling ramp made of scaffolding and it goes up to over 12 feet and the centerpiece on ground level is the, the mirrored installation from the BAMP Center which is uh, arranged as a circle so it's, it's establishing a space for gathering and, and uh, conversation. There's this acoustical uh, dome on top of uh, like above the um, circle of mirrors and it just kind of like um, dampens sound from uh, and kind of focuses uh, the space a bit. Um, yeah, so I'll th so some of this work with uh, longer term uh, engagements with institutions of uh, I'll show you one uh, one uh, other project that I did um, where I conducted a. Um, accessibility and inclusivity study for the Vancouver Independent Music Society. Um, and this is an organization that for the last 10 years has been uh, conducting feasibility studies for a new music presentation space in Vancouver that would be purpose-built for accessibility and music presentation and specifically focusing on emerging musicians. So um, I was contracted to do the uh, accessibility study um, and I reached out to musicians who are underrepresented in the, mu the local music scene here in Vancouver. I, I say underrepresented, I mean um, marginalized and like actively excluded. So I reached out to many artists who had a lot to say about accessibility. Um, and uh, they, you know, I really just asked them what their requirements for a new music venue would be um, in Vancouver. And um, I'm going to share some of their responses. I, I, con I conducted a lot of uh, like public consultations, uh, group consultation meetings, one-on-one -on -one interviews, and, and there was also an online survey to collect uh, responses. And the, the report from this study will be published soon. So um, the, the first set of recommend, uh, recommendations or requirements is by a young um, Cree Dene um, two-spirit respondent who um, was a musician working in um, metal, uh, hip hop and grunge. So this is, uh, these are their recommendations. James. The venue should acknowledge the indigenous land that it is on in ways that are obvious to those entering the front door. Staff should have compassion and show empathy towards those of, from minority groups, such as those who are trans, non-binary and two spirit. The venue should be invested in including those from the deaf plus and hard of hearing community. The venue should have a low stimulation chill out space. The venue should have on-site counseling harm reduction services. The venue should sell cool non-alcoholic drinks and eco-friendly handmade products by local independent producers. The venue should support anyone who is playing or attending um, in having the freedom to do so without barriers. They should be treated with respect and considered as experts in regards to what they need. When, host, when hosting young musicians, the venue should have discounts on rental and free food or food stipends since young people often don't have expendable income. Staff should practice anti-oppression. Alert from calendar, stretch, oh. move, restore. Sorry. Um, the venue should have, oops, sorry. Um, Staff should practice anti-oppression and youth liberation and treat young people like they are a valued guest who has the right to be heard. The venue should value once a year bookings since sometimes these are some important partnerships for organisations and musicians that have limited options for where they can play. Staff should know that to unlearn various forms of oppression is an ongoing effort. The venue should include art and display pieces made by Indigenous artists like chandeliers. The venue should employ Indigenous people as full-time staff. It should feel special to be at the venue. The venue should have counsellors and support workers on site. There should be a sufficient amount of accessible restrooms and restrooms should be gender neutral as a standard. 
the venue should have a recording facility on site as part of a community partnership program. There should be a free food fridge for musicians with vegan options available. The venue should have a grand presentation space where wheelchair users access the stage at the same way that non-disabled performers do. The venue should have on-site emergency response and first aid capacities. The venue should have an Indigenous elder on site and centre Indigenous culture. Brian? These are from a, um, uh, a respondent who is a deaf opera performer. The venue should seat less than 200 people so visitors can see the sign interpreters from any seat. The venue should have a state-of-the-art lighting system that can be programmed and modified for different uses. The venue should have wood floors for acoustics and vibration so deaf performers can orient themselves. The venue should have leveled seating so those who rely on sign interpretation can clearly see the sign interpreter without having to negotiate obstructions. The box office should be staffed with someone who can sign. The venue should offer ASL classes to hearing audiences before performances in order to give exposure to deaf culture. The venue should have signage and ads that explain presentations that include ASL interpretation and ASL music, both for deaf audiences and uninformed hearing audiences. The venue should be involved in developing a deaf-led curriculum for ASL music in order to invest in meaningful inclusion for those in the deaf and hard of hearing community. The venue should offer ASL interpreters at no cost to the performer. The venue should employ deaf people and hearing staff should know ASL. The venue should make relationships with and collaborate with the deaf community. Thank you. Um, the last project I'm going to show before uh, we I have uh, a short uh, piece read um, as a closing to the session, um, if you could go to the next image, um, is a project called Fingerworks for Fireworks. And this is a project by my friend Colin. Um, Colin is depicted in the image, is silhouette, silhouetted, um, and there is a hand on his back the hand, it belongs to Steph Kirkland, and Steph is impressing tactile gestures on Colin's back, and there are fireworks in the distance that are bright against the night sky. Um, Colin does not consider himself an artist. He identifies as blind, and he um, this project grew out of his passion for an annual fireworks festival in Vancouver called the Celebration of Light. And um, as Colin's vision was declining, he uh, tried to find ways to stay connected to this uh, fireworks festival. And he would invite his friends to meet him on the beach and they would just experiment with different ways to translate the fireworks display for him. And um, they landed on this method where um, a friend, it was a one-on-one -on -one experience where a friend would subjectively describe the fireworks display while also impressing these tactile gestures on his hand, arm, or back. And um, this eventually led to a partnership with a local organization in Vancouver called Vocal Eye Descriptive Arts that uh, typically offers um, uh, audio description during uh, at, at theater events. Um, Steph, who's depicted in the image, um, is the director of that organization. Um, and uh, for the last five years, um, Vocal Eye has uh, offered a program during the Celebration of Light where um, members in the uh, blind and low vision communities um, can have this experience where um, this one-on-one -on -one experience where the, the fireworks are described to them and also um, have this tactile dimension as well. Um, I, I really like pointing to this example because I think it, it, it really transcends the idea of an accommodation. Um, I, I think an accommodation is, uh, is really a way of retrofitting participation. It's, it's a temporary bridge to participation in a system that is otherwise un inaccessible. So I like uh, this example um, of accessibility because it, it, it actually transforms the thing that it it provides access to. Um, I had the chance to participate last year and I, I would say that it was the first time that I participated in something that was meant for me as someone who doesn't use vision. Um, 
and that didn't feel like a compromise. I actually thought like it elevated the fireworks display in a way that I felt like privileged to be um, at experiencing. And, and that's not often the case with accessibility. So um, I, I really think of, of Fingerworks as like a local non-visual tradition and an example of accessibility that, um, that really it could set a new cultural standard for accessibility. Um, um, so right now I'm working with Colin as his artistic mentor. Um, I'm trying to support him <laughs> to uh, realize a, a fireworks display of his own design. Um, the first step towards this goal is us spending time at a local botanical garden where we're going to be touching flowers um, and plants uh, since uh, many commonly used fireworks shells have uh, flower names and characteristics. We thought to start there. Um, and um, yeah, I, I really think that, well, this relationship with Colin, um, it really kind of, I mean, he's a, he's a friend, but it, uh, it, I think it, it, it represents a new commitment of mine, which is um, to seek out and support practices that approach accessibility um, as a creative process, um, you know, projects that um, could potentially set a new cultural standard for accessibility. Um, and in closing, I want to share um, just a piece that I, I want us to experience as a meditation. Um, it's a piece called Score for a Temporary Collectively Held Space, and it's a collaboration with Heather Kai Smith. Um, this is a score for the activation of a, a series of play parachutes, the parachutes that you kind of might have played with in grade school or uh, gymnastics um, that a group of people activates together. Um, and so if, if you can, or if you like, um, sh please shut your eyes and as you listen or uh, just experience the piece as a poem. Thank you. Georgia. Great. One, while this invitation is meant for a group of 12 or less, the practice described can accommodate any number of participants. Two, like open access, the practice acknowledges a continuum of, of embodiments, identities, realities, and learning styles. It operates under the premise that interdependence is central to the radical restructuring of power. Three, the practice may be adapted to suit the needs of those involved. Four, a bedsheet can be used in lieu of a parachute. If a bedsheet is not available, the following instructions may be read as a meditation. With a group, find a meeting point. The purpose of the meeting, whether to find common ground or cause the disruption, may change with the practice. The location for the meeting should support what the group intends to achieve. If the space doesn't exist, model the characteristics of the space as part of the practice. Once those with a desire to participate are present, unwrap the parcel. Tamsin, an animated circle. An animated circle, divided by red spokes. Not a wheel, not as uniformly round. The red line, a guiding string, through a pattern of light. Material, blood whistle, flittering edges, recall wildfire, provisions, a series of white tents. Now assess the material, as if rendering care. Locate the nylon handles and, once you have a grip, pull them until the circle opens. While seated on the ground, practice sending a wave to the other side of the circle by slowly lifting up then sharply pulling down. Take turns sending waves to each other until the group is ready to transition. Try increasing the frequency until the waves reach a crescendo then dissipate. While standing, coordinate with others and slowly lift the parachute so it becomes a canopy. Lung, suspended dandelion seed. As it falls, consider, consider the desires that you brought to this circle. Then together lift them up. Continue to hold space for each other until the group is ready to resolve the space. To close the practice, consider each other. You and the communities you belong to are vital the magnetism that brought you together, a form of access intimacy.